whiteness is a very Eurocentric concept which can be linked historically to colonialism and imperialism. I think that the white curriculum is a system of knowledge that's been largely shaped by colonialism, a colonial endeavour. The word whiteness draws attention to something which for a lot of people is invisible, that they don't think about, a sort of blindness to other perspectives. Only having white authors and white ideas being celebrated. When I say white, I don't mean just by white people, I mean those that perpetuate negative ideas and stereotypes about brown and black people. A student who was studying linguistics asked me, why is your English so good? And I didn't hit him, which was sad. But there's been English medium education in India since 1835, since Macaulay's education reforms, because of empire. And people should really know that because they study empire from this perspective that it was like this benevolent Elizabethan NGO that went everywhere to save the world. Um, they gave you the railway. They, we got railroads and we got post and, and you know, machines. Yay! Well, in many ways, the curriculum reproduces it because it's not aware of it. I don't think that there is an awareness that the curriculum is white. I think that whiteness and monoculturalism is normalised in the curriculum in that people don't even notice it. And it's only when you go on a journey of your own self-discovery do you realise that there are women, there are black academics, there are disabled academics who have all contributed, but they're not in the general discourse because the majority of academia, with a few exceptions, is based on status and how often somebody is referenced. So, of course, historically, institutions, even as forward-thinking as UCL, perpetuate the ideas of certain people that have been there for the longest must have the strongest right to claim academic privilege. I think the problem with whiteness as kind of this ubiquitous force is that we don't have the language and the tools necessary to dismantle it or we don't have the power. So um, I began to challenge it when my peers began to refer to Brazilian natives as savages because that had never been addressed in class. Uh, and we weren't taught about any of the colonial history necessarily, we were just taught about how this savage image inspired this white author and how that was a great thing. Uh, it's mainly through the ethnocentric curriculum. Uh, white, black people and ethnic minorities in general, they are excluded from the curriculum. And when, when they are included, it's usually focused on the negative aspects, such as slavery and colonialism. What it does, it, it reinforces a superiority complex, uh, while at the same time building on, on the legacy of what has been going on for the last 500 years. Last year I was learning about the history of medicine and <clears throat> in the introductory lecture the um, ancient medicine was taken to start from like um, what I guess what we would like know now as like the Greek world um, and immediately a medicine from Africa, from Egypt and from the Middle East was like completely dismissed and um, the reason for, for this was because um, there was not enough evidence to say that there was rationale behind their, um, like their medical interventions, and so it didn't count. Um, this sense of entitlement isn't something that just come out of the blue, it's something that's um, been created and manifested over years of subjugation, colonialism, imperialism, so much to the point that it manifests in everything. I mean, people say colonialism is dead, but the reality is it's, um, it's seeped into various sectors, various facets of life. The will to know, which in many ways defined this expansion, um, was not benevolent, it wasn't kind. Um, it was about knowing the people and the places in terms of resources, in terms of labor. Um, it was about markets, trade routes. One weird thing that I realized recently um, was 
I realized that Pearson had had like this huge, huge like part to play in um, eugenics. And like we sort of looked at him very briefly in statistics, um, but like, it, and we knew that he was this like huge, brilliant statistician, but we didn't know that he was also like a giant racist and um, like had a huge part in like the eugenics movement. This um, uh, denying of its own history kind of normalizes the whole whiteness and the Eurocentrism of these institutions. In my religious studies class in high school when I was in year 10 when we were doing the GCSEs, um, we looked at the invasion of Iraq and everyone told me that it was a really good idea. And I didn't really think it was a good idea. I was 14, I couldn't really articulate as to why I thought the war in Iraq wasn't a good idea. But I noticed that everyone around me, apart from my mixed race Iraqi friend, and I thought that the invasion was a good idea. And I guess that was like when I really first felt whiteness in a classroom, because I realized that we thought differently because of listening to my friend Hussein's dad talking about um, Saddam and Ba'athism in Iraq. So it was like, we had a lived experience of hearing about Iraq and hearing about what was happening to Hussein's families, whereas everyone else just saw it as like, yeah, weapons of mass destruction. In my undergraduate experience, we did a general history module um, on modern history, like a survey course. Um, and we covered uh, Napoleon, Marx, First World War, and then we did Empire in one week um, and covered it only in the sense of competition between European nations. Um, and in this seminar, um, uh, one student drew attention to the fact that there was no, um, that all writers on this course, on the, set, on the curriculum, on the reading list, were white and they were all talking about economic competition and the impact of empire on the later economic position in Europe um, and that there was really no discussion on how people felt able to go into countries and treat the people there as less than human. There is very much an awareness about the curriculum being white. It is just that if somebody says that, well, I don't realize that the curriculum is white, because it, it is just because of the fact that that curriculum serves the class interest of that particular individual, and therefore they choose not to see it. I think that like there are loads of ties to imperialism through literature, like Rudyard Kipling by Kim, The White Man's Burden, the fact that that's still taught, I think is quite problematic. That's another example of whiteness being reproduced and being unchallenged. Okay, so I started English last year. Um, I wasn't really that race focused. I was a little bit, I mean, but like a tiny bit on my personal statement, but I was all about Christopher Marlowe and all these white writers because I came from a very multicultural perspective and I just didn't see it as an issue and then it became an issue. Basically, there was Toni Morrison, a black woman writer who's very one of the best writers in the English language, really. And she was the only non-white writer on the first year course. And she was also, I think, the only woman writer at the time. And then apparently they said we need to diversify the course. But what happened was the white students weren't doing as well as the brown students. And because the white are the extreme majority, it just seemed like the whole course was failing when it came to writing about race. They could write about the Middle Ages, uh, you know, old English stuff. They could write about um, monsters and fairies, but they couldn't write about race. Or were they not taught to? Almost all of our texts were racist, so it was very easy to write a wonderful essay on race, which I did. And um, they didn't go down too well with certain staff members who really liked those authors. Despite the fact that, like, the UK colonised many places and so many countries speak English, we don't really study any non-white authors. They replaced that novel with one by a white South African writer. Once you go through the educational system, uh, there is a normalization process that, that is, you begin to accept things that are not normal as being normal. Uh, from primary school until university, uh, the system brainwashes you into believing what they want you to, to believe. I went to a predominantly white school, uh, white private school in East London, and we were taught about colonialism and things like that. And we were taught through the lens where I would say colonialism not only was a good thing, uh, you know, they built, they brought, they brought trains to India, they outlawed, they outlawed primitive practices, they raised the age of consent from 10 to 12. And it was almost like, as a non-white, and I spoke to one of my friends about this, who, who, who's sort of African uh, Ghanaian descent, 
And we spoke, we almost felt ashamed of the fact that like our people were so inferior, were so barbaric. Kuno Diaz said that, um, the, kind of, he said something like the easiest way to create a monster is to withhold its um, reflection. When I was in year nine, I had a teacher and we were doing Empire that lesson and he taught us that when the Indians knew how to look after India, the British gracefully gave it back to them. And I feel like it enforced ideas in the white students of them being superior, racially superior. And I feel at its core, the way that we're taught history at school in particular, is from a, a lens of white supremacy. And a lot of white people come to, come to university having been told for so long that their, their ideas and their civilization is the best. And it's going to take a lot for them to change those ideas. The educational system literally teaches you what to think instead of, instead of how to think. And once you reach university level, Few, few of us question what we are taught. I don't think I've been taught by anyone that isn't white. No one immediately springs to mind. I don't think I have. What I see a lot in academic environments is the hero worshipping of a small but significant minority of privileged people throughout history who have had access easily to the academic environment, opposed to those who have been making history by living. In history, they will, they will have um, thinkers from each of the colonized nations alongside the white historians, um, at least try to, even though they're never going to be the core reading, they will only be supplementary reading. Uh, and when somebody chooses to read the supplementary reading, you'll realize that these are people of a nationality who've been educated in Britain indoctrinated into that system and are perpetuating the same British ideas. Wanting to diversify things is almost offensive in how you're, I know exactly how you're going to tokenize people, tokenize writers and stuff. So the brown kids are like, hey, that's our book, cling. But then they have to sit through this whole like, you know, whitewashed, racist, Eurocentric literature. You're acting like there aren't any good black writers in the English language. I have never ever in my in four years of uh, university level education been taught by someone who wasn't white um, and I, most of those teachers I'd say 70% of those teachers were also male um, and that has the effect of when um, a white ma male teacher is teaching a white male um, writer or thinker at no point does any do, are you do you ever think what's the what's what's happening here it just seems to be the endorsed perspective. I had one black professor at LSE and I don't feel like his being black or if, they, if he was brown made any difference because I feel like to be in a position of power at an academic institution in this country or in any institution in this country or in the Western world you have to be sort of, of the establishment. During my course as Masters in Development Studies at SOAS, all that I was taught by a black professor was Foucault, Marx, Weber, Bernstein. So what about the African scholars? What about the scholars from Australasia? What about the scholars from, you know, Americas? Is it that their views to development is unimportant? There are so many class aspects attached to academia. So for example, my own university, a freedom of information request showed that 60% 60, 60 of all of the students in my university went to a private school, despite the fact that only 7% of the United Kingdom went to a private school overall. This means that they're roughly eight and a half times overrepresented. And so when you've got people who are disproportionately privileged and overrepresented who are making up these centers of academia. There's not really a lot you can do without forcing them to do something. My fear though is that universities and institutions will be approaching these um, issues in a very tokenistic way yeah. as opposed to addressing it on an institutional level because whether we like it or not these biases and whatnot are permeated because of an institutional bias, because of a structural issue. I don't think we can add it just black bodies, I think the most important thing is really to add black minds because it's something that goes deeper than colour. It's, it's an idea of othering, I think, maybe, and an idea that, oh, how can this other person who is supposed to be an inferior race to me teach me something about my own, my own great scientific modern world that I have created? One of my favourite lecturers while I've been at SOAS has been um, white and he specialises in critical theory and gender 
And for the first time when I took her classes, she was teaching Spivak, she was teaching Homi K. Baba, she was teaching Edward Said in depth, and not seeing it as like a cursory extension to Foucault, just seeing it as something by itself. Two weeks ago, I had a class on modernity, and she compared Nietzsche, Hegel, and Kant to Paul Gilroy in The Black Atlantic, and looking at like uh, what Sojourner Truth said when she said, is God dead, at the same time when Nietzsche was writing that. And I thought that was really amazing. Professors of any kind of minority group are more acceptant of, of, of open discussions about race and oppression um, than, than a white male professor would be. You know, if you're brown, if you're black, you are more, if you're a woman, you're more likely to be open to, to a discussion on, some, on the idea of, of problems being intersectional. Within the course that looked to challenge Eurocentric thought, we started out in the first few weeks when we were thinking about the initial theories and the basic theories, which in some way form your frame of reference for later on, um, that, that, that these were all Eurocentric positions, European writers, um, and that the Harlem Renaissance, which we studied for one week, came in like week eight. And in that framing kind of meant that in the last few weeks, we'll, te we'll test out our theories on um, a non-European, non-white perspective and see how that fits. And it probably doesn't fit, but like, it doesn't fit anyway. An LSE student was telling me at dinner yesterday, like, oh my God, there was this Indian mathematician and he did some really good work on numbers and was trying to tell me some stories about him. And I was like, you mean Ramanujan? Yeah, I know him because we study about him. E even if Ramanujan is one of the most important thinkers in, in, the, in modern mathematics, it will take a big effort for him to be included in a white syllabus. I'm not sure if just having diverse staff body without change the curriculum at all would make any difference. I think like both, both things really need to be changed and like everybody needs to work to change them. Stop being so dependent on conventional sources uh, in, in the sense that when you're studying about poverty and development and when you're trying to learn about, you know, burgeoning democracies and how they work and, and resistance and rebellion, you can't be cons consistently and continuously reading what some white man sitting in an office in New York thinks about this. A learner-centered education means a kind of education which focuses on the skills, on the interests, and the community background from which the student comes from, rather than focusing on the, 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 the literature which a group of professors, or maybe a single professor or institution, thinks that a student ought to learn. Maybe there should be some kind of active body or com committee or something to run courses by and say do you think that I have really holistically taken in different perspectives non-white non-eurocentric perspectives into this course and if not what can I do about that and then and for that to be for that to be just standard practice so in the short term I think getting that discussion going for me personally is crucial in the long term we need to be able to create those opportunities for um, people of colour to pursue academia and actively be involved in it. This is probably an indictment in itself, but I've never seen whiteness, whiteness challenged by either students or people within the curriculum. In fact, the discussions that I've had over the last couple of weeks here at UCL have been the first time in my entire academic career where I've seen the no monocultural notions challenged in any way, shape or form. I think that whiteness needs to be challenged at every point that it's found because there's a lot of baggage associated with that that we don't necessarily need now. Like, we, you think we'd be over it, but we're not. I studied um, Charles Darwin's uh, essay on animal humours and <laughs> the people he was talking about in the essay were orientals, right? Saying that, you know, naturally they, um, they show animal humours. And all my peers were like, this is a wonderful text. Like in the seminar, they're like, this is so inspiring, like he's so clever. 